A haunted hotel can sometimes offer travelers much more than a night's stay. But not all guests are told the stories behind the ghosts. Those who learn the legends and dare to stay can find themselves in a room with a disturbing past. Any building can have its share of ghost stories, but it seems that things go bump in the night louder and more often in hotels. Sometimes a hotel's haunted reputation can be traced back to violence long ago. People commit suicide, violent acts take place in hotel rooms. These are the reasons I think hotels are especially haunted. And some believe the older the hotel, the more it is visited by guests from beyond. Built in the 1920s, the Bella Maggiore Inn is one of the oldest hotels in Ventura, California, and has seen its full measure of drama. But one particular room, room 17, seems to harbor more than its share of legends. Room 17 is a beautiful room. In fact, if it wasn't for the ghostly happenings reported over and over again, one might assume it's just another room in a fine bed and breakfast. Employees and guests say the echoes of the room's dark past still reverberate today. A variety of different things have happened in room 17, and many of these events happen to people who don't know it's haunted. The first thing that many guests notice is the pervasive scent of roses. Those who linger may learn the story behind the scent that something disturbing happened in room 17 to a young woman long ago. She came to this place to ply her trade. The Bella Maggiore Inn is located on California Street, which extends right down to the ocean. The street ends at a pier, which was a major thoroughfare during World War II. During the war, it was very active. The sailors used to come into town, and of course, where you have sailors, what else do you have? Women to keep them company, women who sell themselves for money. One of the residents here was a girl named Sylvia, and she tended to have a little bit of a, a harlot background, so to speak, and she was staying here at the hotel. Sylvia had the misfortune to fall in love with one of her customers. Sylvia had grown fond of this gentleman that had stopped in to visit her, and they had started a relationship. For Sylvia, the affair meant much more than money, and before long, the focus of her life became the romance that had blossomed in her lonely room. When at last the war ended, all the world rejoiced, except for Sylvia. Every day, she would look for her sailor, who had mysteriously vanished. She would walk down to the pier and stand there and just look out um, over all the, the crewmen that were coming in and out, hoping to catch a glance that uh, her lost love would be there. And uh, that's where the story begins. The serviceman had failed to tell her that he was married. And after the war, um, he notified her and told her that he was going back home to his wife. And she became very despondent. Sylvia's sorrow turned into despair when she realized that she was pregnant. She felt like she just couldn't continue. And so she went into room 17 and locked the door. It was several days before the hotel staff noticed Sylvia's absence and unlocked her door. 
As housekeeping entered the room, um, they looked around and they could not find her. Uh, they noticed the closet doors were open and they walked over and found that she had hanged herself in the closet. Sylvia's tragic end triggered the beginning of a series of strange stories about the Bella Maggiore. Shortly after her death, um, different things started happening within the hotel. There would be a scent of rose perfume down in the lobby. And then it was tracked back that that's what she had wore. Guests often report that the bathroom lights will suddenly switch on late at night. She's always mischievous, and you don't ever really know what's going to be happening with her. A lady and her husband, older couple, checked into room 17. While at dinner, they had a big fight, big argument. Finally, she decided to go to, to bed with a headache, you know. While she was in bed, she heard the door open. Key in the lock, the door open, and then she heard the door close. She assumed it was her husband. Then the covers move, and something slide in next to her. Well, he snuggled up, whatever it was snuggled up. She said it felt ice cold, like a piece of meat from a meat locker. Just then, she heard a key in the lock. It was her husband. There was nothing in bed with her. They checked out that night. Hotel Bella Maggiore has been the scene of various strange events involving the ghost of Sylvia, a young prostitute who died in room 17 in 1945. When you're walking down the hallway, um, out of the corner of your eye, you'll catch um, a swinging card that has do not disturb on it, and you'll catch it and it'll be swinging. Um, but you turn to look and there's nothing there. Sylvia does seem to crave male company and young businessmen traveling alone have reported some rather strange experiences. They'll feel some tugging at the sheets at the bottom of the bed. It's either that or they will feel that someone has sat down on the edge of the bed in the middle of the night. Or they'll wake up and there is an imprint of a, a, a head on the pillow next to him. It's usually single businessmen that have the impressions on their pillow. Maybe she's just trying to find that comfort that she lost from her long lost love that never returned. I remember talking to one of the night auditors. He didn't believe in ghosts, didn't believe in Sylvia. His last night, he looked up and on the stairs, he saw Sylvia dressed in that style of long ago, and she kind of waved at him and disappeared. Just letting him know that, yeah, there really was a ghost here. In death as in life, Sylvia will sometimes leave the hotel and wander down to the water's edge to ease her loneliness. And according to local lore, her misty figure is sometimes spotted still walking the old forgotten pier. Is it possible that Sylvia's restless spirit is simply trying to expose another ending to her story? A story that ends not in suicide, but murder. Now, for years it was believed that she hung herself. That's what they say. But the tale of Sylvia's last moments may be even more gruesome. There was a sailor, a petty officer, a big man who came and she invited him up to her room and there they engaged in that activity for which he had paid but then at the end he strangled her to death and then fearful that he might be caught and perhaps face justice he fixed her up so it looked as if she had hanged Does unfinished business keep Sylvia at the Bella Maggiore? She's waiting for that sailor to come back. I don't know what she's going to do to him, but if I were a petty officer, I would avoid room 17. It's a great place, but I recommend that if you want a quiet night, maybe check into another room. 
the ghost seems to hold a special grudge against couples, particularly one couple who were on their honeymoon. And as soon as they got into the bedroom and got into bed, something turned the water on in the bathroom. The groom went in to investigate. They went in, turned the water off, got back into bed, and someone flushed the toilet. And the shower went on. He got up, turned the shower off, got back into the bed. The shower started up, and the toilet flushed. The poor wife clung close to her husband all night long, shaking as the water went on and off in their bathroom. The following morning, they were asked how their night had been. The lady said, it was the honeymoon from hell. And then the, the waitress drained white and said, they didn't put you in 17, did they? Over the years, the staff of the Bella Maggiore have reported many strange events. The most remarkable story concerned this one lady, uh, a Latino woman who worked as a maid here. She had a little transistor radio, which she listened to Latin stations. One day, the maid was assigned to room 17. As soon as she walked into room 17, the radio station changed. And instead of her music, everything on the dial was big band. Finally, she started screaming, threw the radio down, and ran down the stairs. She told them to mail her last check home and that they could keep the radio because it was haunted. The staff of the Bella Maggiore feel that Sylvia will continue to confound skeptics. I didn't believe in ghosts at all until I started working here. There is definitely something in this hotel. And so it keeps you on your toes. When a vacation includes a stay at a haunted hotel, some encounters are not on the itinerary. Often shrouded in thick rolling fog, the Scottish borderlands are steeped in history. Local legends tell of bloody battles, forbidden romances, and mysterious deaths. They also speak of tortured souls roaming the land, searching for something they can never find. She doesn't like being interfered with, and I don't think she's, she's a thoroughly pleasant ghost. Perhaps one of the most mysterious stories comes from the picturesque village of St. Boswell's in Scotland. It is the story of the Grey Lady of the Dryburg Abbey Hotel. We had a French couple staying with us. Um, they had a lovely meal um, uh, and went to bed. Uh, and that's the last we saw of them until five o'clock the following morning. Our night porter was, was phoned up uh, and told in no uncertain terms that these people were checking out. They were extremely scared uh, and they needed to get out of the building straight away. But why does this inhospitable spirit send guests fleeing their rooms in the middle of the night? I believe myself that uh, the area of the hotel where these things happen was where their dwelling was all those centuries ago. She feels ownership of that area and, and doesn't like to share it. The present-day baronial-style mansion hotel, which sits on the banks of the River Tweed, was built on the site of the Grey Lady's former home. Next door was a flourishing abbey, which now lies in ruins, ravaged by war. What's left now is the ruins of the 12th century abbey, which must have been quite a sight when it was fully built. The ruins themselves are huge and spectacular, um, but at the same time, it, it's true to say that the place has a, has a lonely feel. It's quite an eerie feel as well. The abbey was destroyed by the English during the violent and bloody border wars that plagued the Scottish countryside from the 12th to 14th centuries. There was constant harrying and raiding. When it came to major raids and battles, they always came through the borders. That was the route. And of course, these abbeys were prime targets. 
The final raid brought 700 men and horse down on top of the abbey in town and left nothing but stony ruins behind. The ruins stand as a silent reminder of the pain once felt in this peaceful land and the pain felt in the heart of the Grey Lady whose ghost is doomed to roam Dryburg forever. The dwelling place that uh, was situated um, where the hotel is today um, was lived in uh, by a fairly wealthy family. Late in life, the lady of the house fell in love with one of the monks from the abbey. For years, the couple tried desperately to deny their love for each other, but to no avail. I've no doubt that the, the lady herself would have been um, very God-fearing and very religious. Uh, and to go against the, the laws of the church, um, or the rules of God, as it were, would have been a, a, a massive step to take. So her love for the monk must have been absolutely tremendous. After years of secrecy, their forbidden love affair was exposed. As it always is, it, it's, I guess, difficult to keep these things quiet for such a long time. Um, and before too long, uh, the, the abbot of the abbey uh, discovered that one of his monks was having an affair with this woman. And uh, rather cruelly, perhaps, um, had him put to death. Horrified, the Grey Lady witnessed her lover's public execution. In those times, it wouldn't have been pleasant. They were a pretty violent, crude people, perhaps, in those times. Unable to live without her love, the Grey Lady made a final resolution. In the hope of joining him in the afterlife, she walked onto the old Dryberg Bridge and found her final resting place in the deep river Tweed. She would have known she'd never been seen again, alive, that is, anyway. Today, the Grey Lady is said to make her agonized presence known around the hotel. The exact spot of the place where she once met her lost lover is now thought to be the hotel's room 216. It is a room that hotel employees avoid. Anybody who is in that room may, may wake up in the, in the middle of the night um, after hearing perhaps um, a window shutting or a door closing. Um, apparently the room becomes rather cold, um, uh, noticeably cold. And then following the eerie cold comes something even more terrifying. They try to move but can't. They feel totally paralyzed. Um, we had one lady recently um, saying that she felt as though she was being gripped by something. She was trying to wake up her husband lying in bed next to her, but couldn't. Um, she was terrified. Others can sleep through the night, but wake to find things they can't explain. People have, have, have gone to bed and in the morning they've, they've come into the bathroom to, to, to wash and so on, and, and the taps are all running. Other ways in which um, the Grey Lady has sort of uh, shown herself has, has been in in turning things on, like the television set, lights. Nights alone can be just as nerve-wracking for staff members. I was actually working here as a night porter at the time. It was quite stormy outside. In the middle of the night, about 2, 3, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, I actually heard heavy footsteps running down the corridor above my head. I ran upstairs to find there was no one, about, no one around, no sign of any guests, nothing. So I sort of mentioned it to my manager. He goes, it's definitely been the grey lady. She's been up to her tricks again. The hotel owners don't blame the grey lady for lashing out. The grey lady wanted to obviously hang on to what she had and uh, is, is angry and embittered by the fact that this, this, this love, this passion was, was torn apart so violently. This is where she existed. This is um, where she had the, the great passion in her life and she wants to, to remember that and, and be around this area. And it, therefore it's a very special place for her and she doesn't want other people to be, to be present, I guess. 
The compassion felt for the Grey Lady's tortured existence doesn't make her any less terrifying. I don't think I would stay in the room alone. Certainly some of the experiences people have had with um, being paralyzed and feeling um, arms around them unable to move, they've been quite scared and uh, I don't think that's uh, the sign of an overly friendly ghost. Uh, I think I'd be scared stiff if I saw the Grey Lady. I think she's, she's lost. She won't be allowed to enter the gates of heaven because she died in a, a violent way by her own hand. Of course, in those days, suicide was a, a mortal sin, and therefore she was probably bound to the town and the, the buildings around it. Ironically, her desperate attempt to reunite with her lover was the very action that separated them for eternity. The monk was at peace with himself and was read the last rites before he died as well, and therefore was willing to go onwards and upwards to heaven. But the Grey Lady is bound forever to Dryberg, the site of both her unholy love and final transgression. And it is her presence that makes hotel guests and staff feel like they are never quite alone. There's definitely something about that room, 216, definitely. The hotel is said to be haunted. You might not be the only guest to visit more than once. 20 miles up the Mississippi River from New Orleans lies a plantation home known as Oak Alley. Its hallways are lined with paintings of those who lived their gracious lives behind its white columns. But it is the one face not pictured here that arouses the most curiosity. A face from the past that has never left this lovely home. Why can't they leave? What happens after death? That's a mystery. Why did this young lady's soul stay in this house? Why just hers? Don't know. Originally called Beau Séjour, the plantation took its present name from its unique driveway. Steamboat captains going up and down the river would get to the Alley of Oaks and they knew they were only a day away from New Orleans. So they said, oh, Alley of Oaks, one more day to New Orleans. And then over the years, it became Oak Alley. Locals know that the alley of 300-year-old oak trees is not the only unusual feature of the plantation. There were all various stories about the ghosts. When I was a kid, we always used to scare one another with, with ghost stories and be afraid to go to sleep. Whispered tales of Oak Alley's ghosts center around a spectral figure known as the Lady in Black. She just um, kind of appears and gives people a little tease, you know, and then poof, she's gone again. The Lady in Black may very well be Louise. Louise Ramon was the proud daughter of the wealthy French Creole family that built Oak Alley in the 1830s. Louise Ramon uh, was of age to have suitors. She was ready for marriage. She had a suitor one night, and she was coming down the staircase, and she looked at her suitor, and he was intoxicated. <gasps> How upsetting. And she saw that he was drunk, and she was greatly insulted and, and indignant and spun around on her heels to walk back up the stairs. But Louise's scorn would have dire consequences. So she just turned around and went back up the staircase. But when she did, she fell. As she fell on the staircase, Louise cut her leg. The wound refused to heal. Gangrene set in. And finally, extreme measures had to be taken. They had to amputate her leg remove her leg. The leg was carefully placed in the family tomb to await the day Louise would join it. Well, now she's a one-legged girl, you know, what are we gonna do with her? 
that really put a, a, a damper on, on her life. So she became a nun in New Orleans, and that's how she spent the rest of her life. Louise died half a century later at the age of 83. But though her bones rest in New Orleans, her spirit is forever tied to the house where the dreadful accident changed her life. She's trapped. She just can't leave. Her soul is trapped. And it's the oddest thing, too. It's surprising that people, our visitors, that have a sense of these things, too, because they'll walk in the house and they go, oh, there's a spirit in this house or I feel something in this house. Guests who report actually seeing the lady in black assume at first that the dark apparition is only a costumed employee. We had a couple one afternoon sitting at the back of the mansion and the gentleman just looking around saw this lady in black. He realized that none of us were dressed that way we're all in different bright colors. And he tells his wife, he says, look, this lady in black, take her picture. She says, but I don't see a lady in black. He said, she's right there. She says, but I don't see her. Nearly every member of Oak Alley staff has had personal experiences. One summer day, I was the last person in the house. I had locked all the doors, the French doors, all the doors in the house. And I was facing the staircase, which is in the hallway. Where here walks this woman, all in black. And my first reaction was, how did she get in this house? It's locked. And I stood up and I walked toward her. She turned and looked straight at me, but then she was gone. And that was really something that made me so nervous. <laughs> she was gone. The lady in black is seen so frequently, it is almost as if she never left the house. I'll come in in the morning, and she'll go through another room, a doorway, and I'll see, like, the end of her skirt swooshing, so I know she's in the house. There are other telltale signs that the house is visited by something that defies explanation. There are little things that go on in the house. We had a lamp on a table, which was unplugged, but the lamp kept going on and off, on and off. And I looked down and I saw that it wasn't plugged. So I said, oh, lamp's not working. <laughs> Let's go on outside. But Louise's spirit seems most tightly tethered to the exact spot where she had her dreadful accident. She appears at the top of the stairs a lot. Many tourists would turn back and they'd say, well, excuse me, who, who was that lady in black that I just saw up there? The low-hanging boughs of the plantation's gnarled oaks have borne mute witness to countless mysteries. People working on the plantation over the years have seen her going through the oaks. She has whispered their names, you know, We've uh, had one tour guide named Peggy. Uh, she used to call out to Peggy <laughs> all the time. Peggy, Peggy. Somebody would be saying, Peggy, Peggy. And she knew that something was going on. It wasn't anybody. It wasn't somebody playing a joke on her or anything. Nobody else was around. Over the years, I've really ended up developing a healthy respect for it. There have been too many things that have happened to people who I respect and who I know are not lying. You know that something's going on. Late at night, the staircase can be a dangerous place to venture. You come into the house at 12 or 1 o'clock at, at night, you always get a little, little tingly. You know, it, it just, um, there's a sense that somebody, that somebody's there. One night, the staircase became the scene of another accident. I got about five steps from the bottom of the stairs and I just took off and landed on my, on all fours. And I kind of felt like something had actually happened to me. I, all, I don't understand how I fell down that way. So I'm mindful of that when I go to the house at night. I, I try to be careful. 
The staircase is also the site of some rather personal contact. Well, there are various stories of, of pinchings. I used to have a lady who, um, who uh, worked for me, Alma, uh, God rest her soul, she's gone to the Garden of Memories. Alma swore there was something on the staircase pinching her legs and had black and blue marks to prove it. She said, that's some ghosts and they pinches you. Maybe the lady in black again. I've never ever believed in a spirit or a ghost. Now I do. Lake Arrowhead, California, has been a popular vacation spot for decades. Its setting promises plenty of fresh air and sunny days. But it was hardly the sun that once attracted some rather shady characters. For them, Lake Arrowhead was the perfect front. When I first found the property, everyone I talked to in this neighborhood kept referring to this building as the old brothel with the, that's haunted. And I kept saying, haunted, what do you mean? Oh, well, somebody died there. That's what I would hear, someone, someone died there. Today's Bracken Fern Manor is a charming inn with a troubled past. The hair on my arm raises up and I just, I want to flee. You want to escape. You just want to leave that spot. In the 1930s, the property was an exclusive hideaway for the wealthy, known as Club Arrowhead. There was a swimming pool. They had horseback riding, tennis courts, barbecues. Um, it was really the place to come. But this wholesome facade had been specifically designed to hide a foundation of crime and vice. This area was originally bought uh, by the gangsters with money from Chicago. The club was conceived by the famous mobster Bugsy Siegel. They thought he was pretty crazy to want a gambling resort so far away from Los Angeles and Hollywood, but that was his point, is that during Prohibition that anything could be done up here. Drinking and gambling were not the only illegal indulgences. These gals that came up here that uh, lived upstairs and entertained the clients didn't start out that way. These were not bad girls, but they were probably having a hard time during the Depression, and so they, they became working girls. Some visitors feel the presence of unsettled souls left behind from the hotel's days as a brothel. Their stories often include one such lost spirit named Violet. I know that she has problems with men, and I think that has to do with her having been kept waiting. Violet was a girl who never liked waiting. Young and naive, she traveled to Club Arrowhead, seduced by thoughts of glamour and stardom. After all, people were being discovered that were ordinary people in, in the film industry, and they came up here to rub shoulders with the rich and famous. The fairy tale endings were not the fate of the girls lured here to the paradise in the pines. They would end up getting stuck here because there was really nothing for them to do. And so the only thing that could keep them here and provide some sort of living was becoming a prostitute. Although forced to accept her new lot in life, Violet continued to dream. There was a similar young man who was also new to the bosses and, and the group up here. He used to hang out over here with the girls. He hadn't quite proven himself to the bosses yet. For Violet, the young man was the answer to her prayers. She fell in love with him and uh, over a period of time, they conspired up a plan with the help of the other girls to smuggle her off the mountain so that they could go and elope. The affair was doomed from the start. The bosses found out about it. Someone squealed somewhere along the way. And they had him taken care of. Violet never found out what happened to her young man. 
They never told her anything, never told anyone what happened to him. She thought he just left her high and dry and um, was brokenhearted, refused to work, and uh, spent a lot of time walking the halls and looking out the windows waiting for him to come back. After weeks of waiting for a love who would not return, Violet took her own life. She was never again to leave the sight of her gilded prison. Even today, we still hear the footsteps, and the guests still tell me about hearing a young lady who's still waiting for him to come back. Violet roams the hallways and rooms of the Brackenfern Manor, trailing a namesake fragrance. I would hear creaking and footsteps, and I could enter a room and smell that old-fashioned violet perfume, and I, I would go down the hall and it would just waft in the air when there was no one had been here for several days. Though self-willed as ever, it seems Violet remains a prisoner. I think she's still, in a, in a way, waiting for that gentleman to return. It's very sad, but at the same time, it's still very determined. She hasn't let go of that last little dream. Brackenfern Manor is thought to be home to more than one spirit, and according to local law, its most mischievous ghost is only a child. When I first bought the building, I would find these footsteps with little toy trucks here and there, and I kept finding this. Keys were just maddening. You would put a key down and it would move. It would just move. I mean, you would, you would just be frantic. You'd go back to get it and it would be just not there. And you'd be looking all over the house and it would be somewhere else. Many feel the ghostly source of these childish pranks was once a little boy named Rodney Rankin. Rodney was the son of one of the girls here. He was about four or five years old. Um, he had a dog, which was his only companion, and I'm sure he was neglected. Mom wasn't a real good mom, obviously, and pretty distracted. Basically, he was everyone's responsibility at one time or another. So Rodney got into a lot of trouble. But one day, Rodney got into some real trouble. He was playing ball, and uh, he threw the ball too far, and dog chased after it, and Rodney went chasing after him. <laughs> Rodney was hit by a team of horses on the curb. They didn't see him run out into the street. Childish footprints and the jingle of stolen keys are the poignant reminders that in this enchanting spot, a lonely child died tragically. Why is it that these spirits continue to linger? I think there's uh, a lot of history that we don't know about the place. Though the spirits that linger within Brackenfern Manor may have never caused any serious mischief, their presence can be unsettling. I've been in this building at all hours of the night and day, but never alone. As far as staying here by myself all night long, never have done it, I have no, no inclination to do so. Stay in a haunted hotel. Sometimes the adventure only begins when the lights go out. In the Loire Valley in France, stands the graceful Chateau de Saint-Loup. With its lacy spires and vaulted rooftops, it is the setting worthy of a fairy tale. The Chateau was built in the 17th century by the Marquis de Carabas, who was immortalized by Charles Perrault in the tale Puss in Boots. But looming close to the fairy tale castle, bound within the same moat, is the chateau's medieval cousin, the keep. It is there that uncommon events are common occurrences. 
Sometimes doors open in the spiral staircase, although nobody's there. In French, the keep has another name. In French, we call it le donjon, but of course, in English, dungeon means something else. It would be rather scary for most people who would come there. Although visitors today find the keep quite comfortable, there are reminders that this thousand-year-old prison once held less voluntary guests. The marks on the wall, well, um, they indicate, unfortunately, the number of days when a prisoner has been in the prison, you see. They scrape the wall and they count the scratches and then they know how long they've been there. And, of course, there are quite a number of scratches in that prison. During the Hundred Years' War, saint Loup was one of the many French castles claimed by the English. Its conquering lord was Edward of England, known as the Black Prince. The young prince's terrifying battle armor was in contrast to his courtly demeanor. The Black Prince lived in France for a long time, and he entertained a court. He was always said to be very elegant with princely manners. In 1356, when the prince was only 26 years old, he defeated the French in the Battle of Poitiers. The Battle of Poitiers should have been won by the French army very easily. It was two or three times greater than the English. But the victory went to the English, and the triumphant prince brought back to the keep his most important prisoner, the King of France. Although their countries were at war, the two men were cousins and close friends. The Black Prince was a second cousin of the uh, French king, so you, sh you should never forget that they were very close and family connected. Although the king was his prisoner, the Black Prince showed his deep respect by acting as his servant. The Black Prince served his cousin, the French King, dinner when he uh, took him to the uh, keep. It would have been very um, unusual at the time uh, for a prince to serve dinner to anybody. But the brutal rules of war would not allow the French King to remain as a guest in the keep for long. As tradition demanded, the Black Prince reluctantly turned his cousin over to the King of England to be held for ransom in the Tower of London. He was never again to see the light of day. It's a sad story because the, the French king was taken prisoner to London after that and died in the tower because nobody paid his ransom. When the Black Prince received word of his cousin's death, he was racked with guilt. His cousin uh, died in prison in the Tower of London, and it was uh, due to him. The Black Prince outlived his cousin by more than a decade, dying in 1376. But some say he still visits the old keep, tortured by the memory of betraying his friend and kinsman. It's always in the keep at night. Uh, we have spiral staircases, you see, so you cannot see very far. You hear the noises. Often the footsteps will slow and stop just outside the bedroom door. In the middle of the night, doors open in the uh, room of the Black Prince, which is at the bottom of the keep. And we had the impression that somebody was there and somebody was visiting us. The door opened calmly. And then we, we felt being watched. And then slowly the door closed, and that was all. The Count feels it is only the Prince's shadowy spirit still keeping watch. I noted that he was very famous for his hospitality, and I often wondered if he didn't come and check if he were sleeping well. Not all of the Count's guests take comfort in the thought of being watched by a medieval prince in the dead of night. Once even, we had a couple of Spaniards who uh, uh, left in the middle of the night. 
for no reason that we could understand, um, and saying that they, uh, they felt so much presence they couldn't stand it. I have the impression that he, he returns um, to do as he always did, to check if his guests are uh, properly accommodated, if they're well, if they're sleeping well, and if everything is in order. Unable to change the past and save his cousin, the Black Prince seems compelled to welcome and protect those who lay their heads in his keep today. One of the attributes of royalty is grace and uh, uh, the knowledge how to welcome. This is the uh, characteristic of the Black Prince. This is the, the feature, the character of our ghost, welcoming. From grand chateau to charming country inns, one question remains. Why do people actually want to stay in haunted hotels? Industrial culture has wiped out any sense of wonder in the world. Everything can be explained. If you were to actually see a ghost, experience a ghost, it would prove there's something more to it. Wonder is the real thing. Ghosts are a kind of way of connecting with, with that wonder again.